your policies. I know that when we meet this urgency with bravery and courage, there is nothing we can't manage. Change is long overdue. We are the chosen few. In you lies all the clues. Here's your cue. You know what to do. This is your heritage. Your inheritance. It's only common sense that you shine. The present is a present and it presents the missing elements. So use your heart and intellect for the human entering. Bridge the 
the gaps, fill the cracks, build the stacks. In this hour, you hold the power. The sky breaks and divine gifts shout. There where you sit in your chair, be filled with hope and let go of despair. Know that your neighbor cares. And from each other, we have so much to learn and so much to share. Prepare. Together, we can do anything and go anywhere. This world we're building is a new one. This union of common humans reminds us that we are one. Under the moon and under the sun, it can and it will be done. Yeah, blessings we are reap and we go it in an unfold. Oh, in a rise and boast. Yeah, we give thanks like we need it the most. We have to give thanks like we really supposed to be thankful. Blessings all from your life and my thank God for the journey, the earnings, the just for the plus. Yeah, my gratitude is a must. Yeah, we see blessings fall by my right hand. What's that to us? Come on, come on. Louder, louder, louder. (laughs) 
It's not business as usual. We have about five minutes before we have the guests of honors come in. The guests of honor coming in rather with the dignitaries. Could I please have Sherry and Malaika? Sherry, Malaika. Right. Did you catch a breath? Have you caught a breath? All right. Please, please, a production by Sherry and Malaika. Let's start off with you, Malaika. Of course, bringing the production together, just let us know what the rationale was. Uh, seeing everything that we've, uh, we've seen right now, aside from giving people heart attacks when the backflips are happening, the rationale to bring it all together. It was a lot of work. We had all of you in mind, thinking about you, ways to inspire you so that you can go out there and do what you do best and change the world and make it a better place. Shay, for you, a lot of our colleagues around the world, but working with kids as well, would like to hear how difficult it is, how easy it is, and then now bring it all to what we've seen. <sighs> Did you guys enjoy the show? I wanted to pull some of you up on stage, but I said, let me not pick the wrong one. Uh, <laughs> we had so much fun miss it, um, making this up, and I slept for an hour and a half last night. Yes, that's the longest in a while, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, once um, Malaika came over to the apartment so we could go through the poetry together, and um, next minute I see a video of myself sleeping on top of the laptop. So um, that just gives you an idea of the amount of work that went in. But um, working with kids is my passion. Um, so it's not a struggle for me, they bring me joy. And one thing I wanna say about the kids and a lot of the dancers in this project, a lot of these kids have tough backgrounds. And what I stand for is getting the world to celebrate African dance while Africans benefit. So some of these kids have had the opportunity to fly to America, Cameroon, and. Zanzibar with me and any opportunity I have to give a child in Africa to get to express their dreams I'm gonna do it. So um, yeah, it was a great time. Thank you So people can interact with the two of you after and during the session right as much as possible perfect So as they leave the stage we we'll just like you to give us a few minutes about one or two minutes and then we'll introduce what the next session is and I'll call upon um, one of the most esteemed people within our industries to carry on the next session. So, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you.
we're getting into the next stage of the session and the opener. Please give a warm round of applause for the person that will take over and carry on the next session. A good friend, esteemed person within the industry, we revere you a lot. Julie Kishuru, who is the Chief Public Affairs and Communications Officer at the MasterCard Foundation. Julie. Good morning. Wow. Wow. Can we give another round of applause to the young people for that energetic start? And just before we begin, may I ask that we all be upstanding for the arrival of His Excellency, the President of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. Thank you. And as he comes, very thankful to Rwanda for hosting this session. Incredible organization, collaboration. Thankful also, of course, to the Commonwealth Secretariat. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please do remain upstanding. Thank you so much. Your patience is greatly appreciated. Smile at each other. <laughs> it's a great chance to have the same energy, embody the same energy we had on this, from the young people on the stage as well, yes? Thank you again for the patience. I see some people shaking hands and introducing each other. Turn to the person next to you, especially if you don't know them. Say hi. Let them know who you are and where you're from. Networking is an important part of what we must do over the next few days. What sector are you in? What's your focus over the next few days? Share that with the people next to you. Ah, ladies 
ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for the arrival of His Excellency, President Paul Kagame. Murakoze Asante Sana. Thank you. You may be seated, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Let me also recognize the presence of the Prime Minister of Bahamas, His Excellency Philip Davis. Great to have you with us as well. Your Excellencies, global business leaders, distinguished guests, it's an honor to take you through this opening ceremony for the Commonwealth Business Forum. A very, very warm welcome. My name is Julie, thank you. My name is Julie Gishuru. I am a passionate Afro-optimist and I am the Chief Public Affairs and Communications Officer at the MasterCard Foundation and it's an honor to be with you all. Now, this gathering comes at a critical point in time for the Commonwealth, for the world. This is an opportunity for us to engage, to learn, to share, to probe, to push the boundaries on our thinking, to connect deeply and purposefully, and to aim high. We face many challenges, we all know this but we also have many opportunities. And how do we unpack this to deliver on a common future? That's why we are here. Before we go any further, allow me to invite the CEO of the Rwanda Development Board, Claire Akamansi, to come up and make opening remarks. Thank you. Mr. President, before you came, we had such a lively assortment of dancers from the Commonwealth. It's very difficult to come after that. Uh, Your Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, the Right Honorable Prime Minister Philip Davis of the Bahamas, Honorable Christoph Fan, Deputy Prime Minister Malta and Minister of Health, Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Lord Marland, Chairman, Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, Captains of Industry, Senior Government Officials, Leaders of Global and International Organizations, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, good afternoon. It's actually good morning. I see that you're following. I am truly delighted to finally say welcome to Rwanda, the land, the land of a thousand hills and a million smiles, and to the Commonwealth Business Forum 2022. We waited a long time to host you, but the wait is over. We are glad that you're all here physically showing the full strength and diversity of the Commonwealth. There's nothing quite like the power of in-person meetings for collaboration and engaged discourse. The Commonwealth Business Forum in Rwanda is truly a momentous occasion. We are particularly glad that the, the Chogam is back in Africa after a whole 14 years. We are privileged to launch together a connected transformative and innovative future. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to host you at a time when the world is getting healthier, more resilient, and even more determined to deliver a common, prosperous future for all. Collective action will be required to emerge from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which indiscriminately disrupted economies, businesses, communities, livelihoods and our entire way of life. 
Yet, before our economies fully recover from the pandemic, we are now also confronted with a tougher macroeconomic environment that is threatening short-term economic prospects. A key lesson from the pandemic is that collaboration is the only answer when confronted with such global challenges. We can only emerge from a crisis when we come together and collectively seek to find the most innovative solutions. This is why this gathering of the Commonwealth family could not have come at a more important time. Over the next three days, business and government leaders gathered here will engage in an impactful and pertinent conversations on trade and regional integration, innovation and the digital economy, sustainability, financing growth, global health equity, and the future of work. Allow me to share four quick questions that will guide our discussions over the next three days. First, how do we enhance trade and businesses with each other to revive and reinvigorate our economies in order to recover from the deteriorated intra-commonwealth trade flows that took us back a decade? Second, how best do we embrace innovation to drive sustainable economic recovery as with so many governments, startups, and businesses do during the pandemic? Innovation matters greatly for long-term global economic growth, but innovation also thrives in diversity, a strong attribute of the Commonwealth. Third, how do we ensure that as we strive for recovery and long-term prosperity, we are doing so in an inclusive manner? We all have a responsibility to create meaningful jobs and opportunities for the 1.2 billion young people in the Commonwealth. Fourth, in all this, how do we ensure that we contribute to a healthy people and a healthy planet? We are grateful to an exceptional cohort of conversation leaders at this year's CBF who are leaders and experts in their fields and who will share their valuable insights on how to deliver a connected, innovative, and transformed Commonwealth. We are further thankful to our leaders in the Commonwealth for including businesses in these critical discussions. A special thanks to our host leader, His Excellency President Paul Kagame, for not only providing a conducive environment for these discussions, but also for gracing this Commonwealth Business Forum with your presence this morning. We also thank our generous partners for this year's CBF. Partnerships are what CBF is all about. When we come together, united in purpose, we will collectively complete the tasks ahead of us. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, allow me to invite all the guests that we have in this room that while you're here, please discover Rwanda. Discover our made in Rwanda products from coffee, tea, electric motorcycles, smartphones, drones, VW branded cars, as well as jewelry. These can be found in the exhibition in Virunga Hall, just below this room, as well as another exhibition that we have for the private sector at Kigali Arena. There will also be a fashion week featuring designers from seven Commonwealth countries. So please don't miss the opportunity to pick a fashion item and made in Rwanda particularly, such as those adorning none other than yours truly. Uh, visit Rwanda and discover our touristic attractions from the rare mountain gorillas to the big five animals, cultural and historic museums, as well as culinary experiences. For this week, remember to sign up for side events such as street festivals, golf, cricket, among others, as well as a concert at the end of the week. Lastly, invest in Rwanda and in the Commonwealth. There are 19 investment promotion agencies from all over the Commonwealth ready to show you investment opportunities in their countries. Visit our own Invest in Rwanda stand here at the exhibition and learn about our own opportunities. And if you decide to invest, we will register your business within six hours here at the exhibition. And to make sure that your luggage is not too heavy, we shall deliver your certificate by email. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to wish you a fruitful CBF 2022 and a wonderful stay in Rwanda. Thank you.
Wow, talk about ease of doing business. Thank you, Claire. Really, really remarkable. The wait is over. This is a momentous occasion. My question back, what will we do with it? What will we achieve over the next few days? And while you're doing all that, visit Rwanda and experience Rwanda. Next, um, I would like to welcome Lord Marland, the chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council and a trustee of the Commonwealth Walkway Trust. A warm round of applause for Lord Marland of Oddstock. Thank you. I don't know about the dancers being a hard act to follow, but Claire, you are a very hard act to follow. You, it's going to be very difficult making this speech as well as you did. Well, we've made it. Incredible, all of you. We've had, we've had COVID, we've had travel difficulties, and we've had more COVID, but we've made it. And I just want to take this moment to remember those who have lost their loved ones, who have suffered during COVID, and uh, who have made the delay of this conference uh, an inevitability. So please let us remember them for all that suffering. But it is irresistible for us to come to irresistible Rwanda. What a fantastic welcome we've had, and what a fantastic company, uh, country. Uh, I went on a motorbike uh, last uh, yesterday round to see the cricket grounds, the new cricket ground that has been made, a really wonderful experience seeing the countryside and its country. And congratulations to uh, Claire and Louise from RDB and indeed my team for putting this magnificent event together. Thank you, they thoroughly deserve that applause. How many times people have said to me, what is the point of the Commonwealth? And if they wanted a good example of what the point of the Commonwealth, they should look no further than here. 1,700 delegates from 50 countries around the Commonwealth, all with a single endeavor. We have leaders of countries, leaders of business, millionaires, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and royalty. Where else do you get that? And of then, of course, we have in the audience all of us who would like to be one of those, particularly the royalty. Um, this is the Commonwealth family. This is what is gathered for the next few days to celebrate and to uh, create a future and a big future for the Commonwealth. And this is proper business. This is how it is done. Interaction, network, discussing, and trading together. For three days, we will talk enterprise, investment, uh, because through these, we have prosperity, growth, and lifting people out of poverty. And these are going to be absolutely critical in this post-COVID era. Uh, uh, era. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to pay tribute to you and your government of Rwanda, because you have created an environment which has embraced free trade, which has made the country secure and safe and has a rule of law that is, uh, that is uh, enforced. And these are the three critical areas that are attractive for business. But most of all, Mr. President, I congratulate you on your vision that you recognize the Commonwealth is the future for trade and business and the vision that you have for putting yourself forward to be chair in office for the next two years. And we wish, we wish you and the country of Rwanda all success. We stand by to help you. Let the business begin. Thank you, Lord Marland. Let the business begin. With that, um, let me now welcome the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth 
to deliver her opening remarks. A warm round of applause as she comes up, please. Thank you. Excellency, President Paul Kagame, my dear sister Claire from the RD, uh, RDB, Lord Marland, Excellencies, distinguished participants, Commonwealth friends and colleagues, and since I am in Africa, I hope you will allow me to say all protocols observed. <laughs> it is wonderful to see so many of you here in Kigali. And I'm delighted to welcome you to Chogham and the Commonwealth Business Forum. It's been a long time coming, but it really is worth the wait. Our Commonwealth is a growing family of 54 nations and it's home to one third of the world, more than 2.5 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30. So we are a young, vibrant Commonwealth. And our mixture of advanced economies, developing economies, and small states is spread across the globe. We are bound by values enshrined in our charter, values of peace, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, solidarity, collaboration, and mutual respect. We benefit from practical similarities in language, common law, regulatory coherence, and large and dynamic diaspora communities. If you look around us, we are one. And for these reasons, when I took office as your Secretary General in 2016, I outlined my vision to put the wealth back into Commonwealth and to put the common back into wealth so that we all could share in a future filled with prosperity. And at the very heart of our mission of all 54 countries is trade, the lifeblood of economic activity and the arteries of the economic relationships between our Commonwealth member countries. And at the heart of our approach to trade is our shared advantage, the Commonwealth advantage. The Commonwealth advantage is built on the conjoining of values, practical similarities, and shared interests. It means that whilst the Commonwealth is not a formal trading bloc, trade costs between Commonwealth countries are 21% lower on average. Investment flows between Commonwealth countries are on average 27% higher than those between other country pairs, almost tripling since 2015. And the combined GDP of Commonwealth countries is now around 13 trillion US dollars. And it is estimated to reach $19.5 trillion in 2027, just five years away. And the advantage reaches right across our Commonwealth. And I can assure you that our small states are part of the Commonwealth advantage, with Commonwealth countries accounting for more than 30% of small states' international trade on average. Yet, as we gather here in Rwanda, the outlook for global trade has become more challenging. There is potentially slower GDP growth or even recession 
in some economies. Persistent supply chain disruptions, rising inflation, interest rates, and debt. Soaring costs from freight to food and energy, and the wider economic repercussions of the war in Ukraine. I am, however, reassured by three key findings from our latest research on trade. First, intra-Commonwealth trade exports surpassed the threshold of 700 billion US dollars in 2019. Second, these exports rebounded in 2021 and are estimated at 768 billion US dollars, the highest ever recorded in value terms. So we have gone against the global trade and our Commonwealth advantage stays strong. And third, we project that intra-Commonwealth exports will grow steadily over the next five years, surpassing one trillion US dollars by 2026. And we hope to put trade back on track following the unprecedented economic setbacks caused by COVID-19 pandemic and the spillover effects of the Ukraine conflict. Of course, an inclusive and sustainable recovery in trade requires a strong and effective rules-based multilateral trading system. And I really wish to commend the efforts of the World Trade Organization, its members, the Director General, and the Secretariat staff for delivering a successful outcome to last week's 12th ministerial conference. Because besides restoring confidence in the multilateral trading system, the Geneva package will help boost COVID-19 recovery and build resilience whilst tackling current and future global challenges. And I'm really delighted that during uh, MC12, the Director General of WTO and I signed an MOU specifically to enable us to work more trenchantly together to promote trade and equity for all our members. This MOU joins those we have signed with UNCTAD, with ITC, with the UN, with the African Development Bank, and I'm so glad to see my dear brother, Akin and Asina here. And I want to just remind you that um, the African Development Bank became number one financial institution in the world today. So. I think he really deserves that clap. And we've also joined with the Caribbean Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, amongst others, thereby and therefore strengthening and enabling the multilateral fabric to grow stronger so that it will benefit us all and improve our cost effectiveness and our efficiency. And it's clear from both the WTO and the Secretariat research that digital trade is an increasingly important part of our future and the WTO and the Commonwealth believe that the Commonwealth can be the fulcrum for global good practice, regulation and statutory certainty in this area. And we are working with all our member states under the Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda, we have identified five pillars. The first, digital connectivity cluster. Then there's the physical connectivity cluster, the regulatory connectivity cluster, the supply side connectivity cluster, and the business to business connectivity cluster. Each of these pillars are led by our member states. And I am happy to inform you that substantial progress has been made to boost intra-Commonwealth trade and investment. And this pathway will lead us to our goal of 
2 trillion US dollars in inter-commonwealth trade by 2030. There are many opportunities for us to work together to boost intra-commonwealth trade. But what we know is that we have to have solidarity, determination, and courage. And our member states are showing all of those elements. We are going to improve connectivity, enhance cooperation, promote regulatory coherence and interoperability, improve trade logistics and trade facilitation, break down barriers, leverage digital technologies and e-commerce, empower women and young people as entrepreneurs. And can I just say, no one, absolutely no one, has more intelligent, courageous, inspirational, wonderfully innovative young people than we. And they are kicking it out of the park. So I think there's an opportunity for us to seize the long-term benefits of green trade and the energy transition. And we are already working together on these issues, on all of these issues, through our connectivity agenda. We've got our blue charter, our sustainable energy transition agenda, and if the leaders agree, we will have our living lands charter too. So those three Rio conventions won't just be a dream. Our members are going to turn them all into the new reality. And there are other initiatives and programs to help boost trade recovery in a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable way. And we also support small states to access trade finance through the Commonwealth Small States Trade Finance Facility. And I hope that this business forum, this long-awaited, glorious business forum, in the land of a thousand hills and a thousand opportunities will really give us the opportunity to come even closer together, to redouble our commitment to enhance the framework for intra-commonwealth trade and to put the target to reach two trillion in intra-commonwealth trade by 2030 beyond doubt. We have the ability we have the opportunity. All we have to do is choose. And I'm so glad everyone here is making that choice. So I look forward to all that you will achieve, all the innovation, all the energy. And I know many of you will be looking at Lord Marland and wondering how on earth did he get that tan? We need to give him a bit of competition, those of us of African heritage. And I thank you. Thank you very, very much, Secretary General, for those comments. We must put trade back on track, and we need it to be inclusive and sustainable. But allow me just to take a moment to ask Akina Desina to stand up for a moment and can we just recognize the achievement of the African Development Bank, ladies and gentlemen. It's no, no small thing. It's no small thing. And a very big part of inclusion and sustainability is building strong, local, indigenous, and as we're on the continent, African institutions, really, really important. So let me just highlight that as well. And really, really good to hear how we center women and young people at the middle of all of this. Thank you so much. At this point, um, we will be headed in a moment into the panel session, but first we're going to watch a video. Let me ask the team to play the video, We Are the Commonwealth. Thank you.
it's called technical issues. <laughs> Global health so inequity was exacerbated. Prevention measures such as restriction of movements negatively affected the way we interacted. I request uh, the technical team, can we play it after the panel session? And we'll try to make sure the sound is aligning with the video, if that's all right. And we'll go straight to the panel session right now. Um. Gentlemen, let me welcome the panelists and we can give them all a round of applause once they are all seated, please. First and foremost, Your Excellency, President Kagame, please do come up and take a seat. Murakose. Yeah, did I say it right? <laughs> Next, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome. Uh, Maktar Diop, uh, please, uh, Executive VP, IFC, World Bank, please do come up uh, and take a seat. <laughs> right next to me, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Andrew Forrest, non-executive chairman of Fortescue Metals Group and chairman and co-founder of Mindaroo Foundation. Please do come up right next to His Excellency, please. Thank you. Dr. Akinwonmi Adesina, please do come up, President of the African Development Bank, right next to Dr. Forrest, please. And last but certainly not least, and I'm so happy to see another lady on this panel with me, Amali Chivanti who, uh, de Alvis, who is a CEO of Subank. A warm round of applause, please, as she comes up. So thank you all, great, great to have you with us on the panel. As we start the conversation, one quick starter. A question around this common future. We are here talking about delivering on a common future, but per you know, perhaps the first question is, do we all have a common vision for this common future? And I wanna tap into each of your thoughts on that. When you think of what this common future should be, paint a picture for us. What do you see? His Excellency, let me start with you, please. We may not take it for granted that uh, it is that way, but we can work at it and make sure that it is the way we want it. First, to make it common to all of us, that that is the understanding. But what is to be taken for granted is that there is a future for us. So I think it's always going to be work in progress that uh, people will keep harmonizing their different views about what we think, what we have to do, looking at the future and, and what we want to, to see in, in that future. So I think there is already the understanding that we have to work for a common future. Uh, so we have to work uh, at that and make sure that we, we get it. So I think it's, it's work in progress. We are moving towards the point and uh, I am optimistic that uh, the world has a lot of divergences, but at the same time, on everyone's mind and every nation's vision, there is thinking of that common future. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you believe there's a common understanding. <laughs> let, me, let me jump to Amali on this one then. Thanks. Thank what you. do you see? Thank you very much. Um, I think the, the, the biggest common point, I think, for all of us is that we have a planet to live on in 100 years' time, and that all of us who are living here can do so with access to health care and to education, um, that we can be thriving in our countries, that we can be looking after our natural resources and managing that effectively whilst driving the growth and prosperity of our countries as well. Um, this is not an easy challenge. 
um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. You know, I think we see some incredible work being done, and I'm, I must admit, I'm blown away. My first visit to Rwanda, you have an amazing country, President. Um, and I think, you know, the, for me, coming here and having us all together to be able to share our knowledge, share our resources, to help each other to solve these big challenges, that's the common future uh, as I see it. Um, and certainly I'm feeling very bullish um, that I think we are heading in better directions with that. Thank you for that. Makja Diot, from your view, what do you see? I'm seeing a world which is uh, full of uncertainty, but I think that uncertainty can be transformed in certainty. And uh, to do that, we need to structurally transform what is happening on the continent. Uh, all these uncertainties coming from crises which is multiform, food, health, slowdown, disturbance in the value uh, supply chain. But what we have seen here in Rwanda in response to the COVID-19 crisis is a good example of what I'm telling in terms of structural transformation, which requires for me three things, ambition, vision, and implementation capacity. When the crisis started and the world was talking about vaccine crisis and inequity, this country sees that opportunity, sees that moment to say let's do things differently and uh, structurally. And this is good illustration of what I think that needs to be done and the vision I have for the continent. A, vi a, a vision where the continent will take this uncertainty, transform it in uncertainty, and to do that, we have all the instruments, and one of them is Africa Trade uh, 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 Agreement. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Adesina, your view. Well, thank you. Uh, first, let me thank His Excellency President Paul Kagame for inviting us here, so I have an opportunity to thank you and also to thank my dear sister, uh, Secretary General Patricia Scotland for this fantastic meeting. I think when one talks about common future, President Kagame said it already. And I think also um, what's, uh, what just said by Mokta, when you enter Kigali, it's different every single time you enter it. The last time I came to see the president was three years ago. And I couldn't even recognize Kigali when I got here. So when we talk about a common future, a common future needs good leadership to shape that future. And that's what you have here. And I also think that kind of common future is what Patricia Scotland just very well explained to us here just this morning. The second thing I want to say is just listen to the Secretary General just as what she was talking. You were saying that the size of the economy of the Commonwealth will grow, it's about 13 trillion now. Now, but the issue is, it's concentrated though. Five countries are the ones that actually control most of those. That's in, that is UK, that is um, Australia, Canada, maybe Nigeria, and India. So that common future must be exactly what President Kagame said, common wealth. It must be well shared all across. The second one is also that the common future must be the future of the youth. And when I was just watching up there, and you said 60% of the population of the Commonwealth is less than the age of 29. So the future is here. So we got to make sure that we build the Commonwealth for the youth. It's 73 years old, but it's actually a very young Commonwealth. And the last point I wanted to make on the common future is what Malice said. We cannot have a common future without a common planet. So we have to have climate resilience. We have to make sure that, as also President Kagame and also Mokta were saying, that we also have vaccines. Today we are here, we are doing well because we have vaccines, but it's an inequitable access to vaccines. Only 16% of Africa has access to vaccines. So we cannot have that common future in which we all live unless we have equitable access to vaccines. Thank, thank you so much. And, and there's a lot of ongoing work on the continent in that regard as well right now. Um, Dr. Forrest, let me come to you. What do you see? What's a common future for you? Well, I'm, I have to admit to being really excited about the vision that I see for the Commonwealth. Um, and it's kind of encapsulated, I think, in my relationship with President 
Kagami, we had dinner together in my home not long after you became president at, at your first Chogham, I think. And just to see the growth across the Commonwealth, but in particular in relation to human values, human rights, where we have to start is equal education outcomes, not targets, equal education outcomes for girls and boys. And of course, that removes any possibility of having forced marriage or childhood marriage or any form of modern slavery. We're not gonna get there with those things which are dragging the economies down. But how to build the economies up? Well, I think the greatest way to build the economies up is just to come swinging back to vaccinations. We have to remove the fear of disease. That is for certain we need to really prolifically invest vaccinations into Africa. But even more prolifically and even more certain and more permanently, we've got to invest in our children. We have to invest in girls and boys, equal education outcomes. And how then do we create this level playing field between developing nations, between African nations, Commonwealth nations and the rest of the world? Well, it isn't through just continuously backing dirty fuels, continuously backing hyper expensive, the more you use it, the more expensive they become, fossil fuels. We have new technology breaking across the world. We have a huge new possibility for every member of the Commonwealth, particularly here in Africa, of very inexpensive. The more you use it, the cheaper it becomes. The more you use it, the more abundant it becomes, and that's renewable energy. Green electrons from electricity, green molecules like fossil fuel, but this time they don't destroy the environment. You can transport them everywhere. A transportable energy future like coal, oil, or gas, but it's fully green, no harm, and the more you use it, the cheaper it becomes. Here in Africa, the Renewable Energy Agency of the world says you have a thousand times more renewable energy than you're ever gonna need by 2040. Let's capture that for the kids. Let's capture that for the economy and let's capture that for equality. Thank you, wow. That's an incredible statistic. Uh, let me come back to you now, President Kagame. And when you look at the role of the Commonwealth on delivering on this common future, and I think we've mentioned the importance of leadership importance of so at you know national level country level you know talk us through the role of the commonwealth and what we need to do better what we need to lean into yeah with the commonwealth um, we already have many things in common indeed be it the language be it uh, the different systems uh, financial systems that would enable us to make investments, uh, trade with each other, uh, all together. So there is a starting point that is more or less, I would say, good enough. But we need to make it better. We need to keep making sure that the Commonwealth, when we talk about the Commonwealth, we actually mean the Commonwealth, not uh, just that being common to a few of the many 54 countries. So, and this is why I said it keeps being a work in progress. We keep having to engage one another, finding out what we can do uh, to bring that balance to the extent that uh, everyone in the Commonwealth, the family of nations, uh, fears, they are part of it. Right. Uh, no one is left behind. I think this is what we have to, to, to focus on. Um, so that, um, you know, even those at the lower level, this that was said earlier, the small developing uh, nations feel they are not left behind. We, uplift everyone and, and move towards that and fulfill that obligation to the commonness that we uh, aspire to 
in this family of nations. So, whether it is trade, it's, uh, trade and business, investments, different things. When other issues were talked about, health, you know, we had this pandemic, we had uh, a shortage of uh, vaccines. At times, vaccines were there for uh, fewer countries than, uh, you know, the many that we are left without for quite a long time. But at a certain point, of course, uh, we were able now to see that uh, flow to, to the people who were lacking uh, in that. But, but the pace at which things move uh, needs to be increased. Uh, and so that we give more value to the Commonwealth and the feelings uh, of the people of the Commonwealth. Okay, so the pace is really important then. Let's go ahead. And I think referencing also, the, I, it's so well put by uh, the Secretary General, Patricia Scotland, earlier, you know, how to put the common back into the wealth, ensuring inclusion, ensuring a feeling of belonging and value for the small as well as the bigger uh, members of the Commonwealth. And uh, th thank you for that. Let me come to you now. As Managing Director of the IFC, Magdar, what kind of mechanisms for finance do we require in place to really deliver on this vision? Oh, thank, you for, thank you very much, Julie. I would like just to, to rebound of what President Kagame just said. I think that when talking about a commonwealth is a mold in common, and uh, he's been challenging all of us to be moving faster and to do our share, which is quite essential if we want to build this world in common. Uh, let's take the case of vaccine. When the challenge came, President Kagame, with his vision and his, his leadership, uh, abroad the country to hopefully being able to produce very soon vaccine. What is the shared responsibility and commonality? Is the rest of the world now needs to buy this vaccine? Rwanda has done what it has to do, is to do the first step, to use its resources, to mobilize people, to organize that. But if the world doesn't come and buy this vaccine, we don't see that commonality arriving. That's where I see the transformation of the continent. Let's take another example. We heard that uh, Rwanda is producing EVs. We're talking about climate change. They, this is a contribution, one of the contributions to the fight against climate change. But if the rest of the world doesn't buy the EVs produced here in Rwanda and only buy it in countries we used to buy, it, we will not have that share uh, wealth that we are talking about. Let me take a third example, which is the food crisis. The continent has a potential to produce and to have a resilient uh, value chain in food production. We have a lot to do in Africa, and President Kagame is challenging us every day to do more, and he's doing more for his own country, to build a resilient value chain in Africa, and the potential is here. My brother, Akin, has been advocating it all, all his career because it's his specialty. But if we don't have also a trading mechanism which allow African countries to, to export those, those products which has been transformed here, where the value addition has been increased here, we'll not be able to reach that. So this is a challenge of the communality of this wealth that we are talking about. So how to reach there? First, as I said, is ambition. Not to have a ceiling and say, this is not possible in the continent. The second one is to have the vision on how to do it. The third one is implementation. And President Kagame, every time I meet with you, Ex Excellency, you go back to me and say, implementation, implementation, and implementation. We have now some tools. In IFC, for instance, what we are doing more and more, we'll be financing we have a special facility for SMEs in Africa, and we'll be financing trade, fin trade financing. As been mentioned earlier, trade financing will be an essential part of being, building a resilient ecosystem and value chain in Africa. So we need to dedicate particular and specific resources to help intra-Africa trade. So these are some of the elements that I think will be uh, uh, helping moving forward. And lastly, de-risking investment. You have a lot of businessmen here who don't know the continent as we know it and who would like to put their money in the, 
in the economy, but ask us to de-risk it. So we'll be bringing our resources to de-risk it and, and, and to be able to attract more investment. So we have a very full agenda before us, and we are very glad and lucky to have President Kagame to, to guide us in that process. Thank you. Thank you for that very, very clear ambition, the vision to get there, implementation, abs absolutely critical. And as we've been talking about vaccines, maybe just important to say that Africa's response to COVID-19 through, you know, empowering the Africa CDC has been a really critical factor as well in driving, um, you know, the ability now for this bold ambition around vaccine manufacturing and even delivery of vaccines. And this has been a partnership effort between heads of state. As a foundation, we were honored to partner with the Africa CDC on the saving lives and livelihoods partnership and what I'd like us all to sit and think is as we talk about this whatever sector you're from what's your role in plugging in and how do we best work together and partner to really move things along so uh, Amali let me come to you next and let's just take a look at um, you know, the role of technology and innovation in addressing today's most pressing issues is really, really important. And I know you are very passionate about sustainable growth and combating climate change. So talk us through what you see. Where do we need to step up? What needs to be done? I mean, te technology is amazing, isn't it? I mean, we, we have gone through, and I was chatting to some other guests on the way here and saying, you know, what a different COVID we would have had maybe 15, 20 years ago if technology wasn't in the place, you know, the ability for us to continue. Each of us here today, we carry around supercomputers in our pockets. You know, we have wristwatches which probably have more compute powers than we use sending people to the moon. You know, so technology is now fiber. This is what connects us as people, as populations. Um, my company, Subak, we were set up during COVID. I have uh, our office in Australia. I've never met these people. Everything was done remotely. When I hear things about how we can set up businesses in Rwanda in, what was it, six, six minutes, was it, or, some, or something like that? Six hours, six hours. Six minutes is the next goal, Claire, maybe. Claire, Sorry, Claire, Claire giving you big jobs here. The new challenge. Um, <laughs> but this is incredible, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is what technology allows us to do. Um, and, you know, Subak is, we're named after the Indonesian Water Cooperative, and the way that we see it is to say, look, uh, data is our water, right? This is what feeds us. Information is what helps us to grow. And I think the ability of technology to connect us across all of our regions for us to learn from each other um, is so critical. Um, you know, we, we, we launched our uh, data catalog, so everyone here, if you are interested in climate data, data.subak.org, you can go and access this. So for everyone who is solving problems, what we basically say is, look, whatever your system, whatever you're trying to do, whoever you are, private company, public company, NGO, individual, let's help you find this information and use the technology. Um, and you know, it's fantastic to see how startups, how young people are using this. Uh, so we recently signed our first Rwandan fellow, our research fellow, an incredible young man, Ghislaine, who is looking at um, EV uh, vehicles and creating dashboards to optimize that. We have companies who are looking at satellite data of the Congo Basin to look at where illegal logging and roads are taking place. So these is what technology allows us to do to solve these big problems at speed collaboratively. Um, and I think, you know, for all of us here, you know, to take that opportunity to nurture that, um, and I must admit, you know, I'm, I'm, this is my first uh, visit to Rwanda. I am very much hoping it won't be my last because I'm so excited by what you are doing here. Um, and uh, I think if I can have a few conversations, I'm meeting with your, uh, your director of your Kigali uh, Innovation City later, um, but I would love to bring Sabak here. We are launching a fundraise and I would love to make uh, Rwanda our, our our uh, continental hub, actually, for climate data. Yeah. Um. Wonderful. Andrew, let me come to you. I think you painted such a vivid picture when, when, when you were looking forward for us. And uh, just want to tap more into this idea of access to just, inclusive, and equitable energy transition. How do we achieve this? Because that's, that's, that's the whole challenge, right? So what's that journey and what role can different stakeholders play? Yeah, let's just go to His Excellency's magic words, which have been repeated my, by my brothers in development. Uh, implementation. Now, everyone can have great ideas, great plans. Uh, there's projects which have been in Africa which haven't been developed for decades. 
Um, but I believe their time has come. You know, when, when we think of Africa as a huge green energy superpower, which first has supplied all the electrons to keep these lights on to allow kids to do their homework at night, which is bereft to many, um, that we can in fact dramatically accelerate cheap energy to all the homes throughout Africa with very cheap electrons because we now have green energy, then we have to think what is stopping the implementation of that? If, if that can create the equity we need to make sure little girls have the same education outcomes, therefore the same opportunities as boys, then what's getting in the road of that? Well, I can only give you, Your Excellency, and all of you, my own personal lived experience. There's a lot of talk out there in the Western world about the trillions of dollars of capital which can be made available to developing nations, to African nations, to the Commonwealth, but it doesn't actually appear. It's more like fake friends. And the stumbling block here for my real friends on this stage and in this audience is that while the capital is there and the projects are there and there's great managers like my own team and many other teams around the world who can implement these projects, we can take construction risk, we can take execution risk, we can take finance risk, we can take marketing risk, long-term risk, short-term risk, but what we can't take is sovereign risk. And who's best to provide sovereign risk? Sovereigns. And you've got these spectacular multilaterals here on this stage, which could manage this like that if we can get Western nations to step up and say, okay, you don't want money from us, that's fine. You can get it from the capital markets. It's free, fair, competitive markets. And it's abundant. There is no shortage of capital. It's the allocation of capital to give the implementation the president asked for across his nation, across all Commonwealth nations. We removed that sovereign risk, which is simply expropriation mm -hmm. or egregious, or that means very unfair tax changes. Remove that risk through insurance and these multilaterals are amongst the best in financial history, not best in the world best in financial history at getting developing nations going, they can muster that insurance. We can finance from across the world from those trillions of dollars and then we can implement President Kagame's dreams. That's real talk. Thank you. Thank you for cutting to the bones of it. Um, let me come to you now, uh, Akin, and just asking, you know, when we look at youth and women, and we're sitting on the continent with the fastest growing youth population in the world, we've recognized that 60% of uh, people in the Commonwealth are young people. Um, so what is our role and how do we go about enabling and empowering young people and women? Uh, thank, thanks very much. You know, the first is that to be able to support young people um, we all, in all of what we do, we have to prioritize young people in all of our financing. Mm. Because I think that for Africa and, and for all of the Commonwealth countries, the real issue is we have to create youth-based wealth. You know, if you have a demographic that is actually aging in some places and a lot more in terms of young people, what they actually need is access mm. to skills to education, to finance. It's very, very critical that we do that. Now, let me give some concrete examples about how we are doing this at the African Development Bank. You know, we've put the issue of jobs for youth in Africa at the center of what we do. Before I was elected, when I was elected president of the bank, seven days before I took my job, I went to, what is that place in your country? Gore, Gore, Gore Island, Mr. President. I went over there and I stood in this door, which you call the door of no return. And that's where they took all the slaves out. And I asked myself when I go back into my car, this is where they took all of our talents, our strong people, our, you know, everybody out. But then I got into my car and I started thinking, today, 
those people left, they were taken against their volition. Today, we have young people on their own volition. They get on rickety boats and they head to the Mediterranean, heading to Europe. So let me be very clear, Secretary General, I don't believe that the future of Africa's youth lies in Europe. I don't believe it lies in Latin America or Asia or anywhere else. It lies in Africa growing well, able to create quality, decent, competitive jobs for its young people. And I'll give you com concrete examples. For example, right here in Rwanda, we started a program called Coding, I mean, just also like Mali was saying, Coding for Employment at the bank. This work is to prepare the youth for the digital future that the Secretary General was talking about. We, we established about 130 centers of excellence that will have about 234 young people, 1,000 people that are coders. Right here in Rwanda, Mr. President, we have with you the Kigali Coding Academy, Rwanda Coding Academy, which is to develop world-class people in software engineering. In Nigeria, we have folks from Nigeria here. We have an iDice program in digital and creative industries. We are investing $170 million there with Islamic Development Bank with also our joint sponsor to develop more to help to create about 6.1 million jobs, right? So I think we have to upskill the, the, the youth for the jobs of the future. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, I cannot say this without talking of agriculture. You know, agriculture is the coolest jobs in the world. Um, and, I, and I hope that our young people will realize that because the size of the food and ag business in Africa by 2030 is going to be worth a whopping $1 trillion. So if you're trying to be a billionaire, it's not going to come from oil and gas. It's not, nobody drinks oil, nobody smokes gas, everybody eats food. And so we got to be into agriculture as a business. The third thing that I want to say is finally about how we finance young people. You know, he was just saying, Fortes was talking about how we finance the issue of climate and, and, and energy transition. But today you look at Africa. Our financial institutions are not set up for young people. We have missing financial institutions. We have actually missing markets to serve them. We have a population, young people, Julie, 455 million people. It's going to rise to 845 million by 2050. So we have to create new financial ecosystems around young people. And that's why at the African Development Bank, we took the decision that we are going to now create what is called youth entrepreneurship investment banks. There will be new financial institutions. There will be, Mr. President, there will be new financial institutions that will create ecosystems of support around the businesses of young people. Today, you go to a bank, you're trying to get money. They ask you, how old are you? You say, 21 years old. They said, go and bring your tax receipts for the last 40 years. What does that really mean? So, but these youth entrepreneurship investment banks will finance the businesses of young people in a life cycle model throughout as you use different instruments from technical assistance to debt to equity financing to grow their businesses. The point I'm trying to make is this. The future that we were talking about at the beginning of this panel for it to happen, we have to create new financial institutions that can create youth-based wealth. And that is what we are focusing on. And those institutions, by the way, we're designing them now. They'll be ready by the end of this month. Excellent. Excellent. Really, really great to hear that. We've come really to our final question. I want to pose the same question to all of the panelists and just, you know, uh, fully aligned with this approach focusing on young people and women and at the MasterCard Foundation, our Young Africa Work Strategy is focused on delivering you know, 30 million young people with work opportunities. Dignified and fulfilling work is our focus. So we are walking this journey together, all of us doing our respective things. And so as we close this panel, my question is, what is the promise that we must make to young people in the Commonwealth? and young people across the globe, I guess, by extension. And Amali, can I begin with you? I think building on my fellow guest here, I think the promise of education, that we will train them to have the skills that they need to fit for the future. You know, whether that is growth in agriculture, whether that's in climate issues and technology and finance, 
Um, if we don't do that, we're doing them a disservice. And that's the one thing that we can do is make sure that they have the skills to actually uh, be successful in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let me come to you. Yeah, I think we just have to create more space for young people um, in, every, in, in every sector, in, any, in every area. You know, we always say the future belongs to the young people. I don't believe that. I think the present belongs to them. So we have to start by investing in them today. And, in, you know, and when I look at the, the things that we just have to do is, sometimes I go around, a lot of times I go around, I find people saying, we want to empower the youth. But I've never really seen a young person walk up to me and say, I'm being empowered. So it seems that those that want to empower them are empowering themselves. So the youth don't need empowerment, they need investment. Invest, invest, invest. In wow. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah, look, I only completely applaud that. I, I totally agree. I'd probably come back just another step and say we need to, to educate our little girls and boys to equal standards to become young women executives and, and young male executives so that they can take these business opportunities which are out there. And the great notion that I see is a huge future of, of inexpensive energy which will keep Africa green which will keep agriculture growing to the multi-trillion dollar opportunities it can be and not the fuels we currently worship and we currently are, seem to be aligned and stuck to. And that's fossil fuels which, left unchecked, will destroy the future of every young person in Africa, turn Africa into deserts. That is a future which we can scientifically see. It's not contentious science. It is there for you to see. We need to say, okay, let's adopt these fantastic principles, but let's now bring in the era of totally clean, only green, inexpensive energy so that all the young people can rise and go into that future which my friend is speaking of. I want to make sure those foundations are there so that you as great bankers, great financiers can lend to these young people and you, Mr. President, can ensure that a quality of opportunity which is led through cheap green energy, equal education outcomes is there for every developing nation. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Matt let me come to you next. Just uh, let them talk. And not talk on their behalf. That's my vision. Uh, youth, like uh, small nations, are often in the world arena talked about and talked for. And I think that what I would like is to see more and more young people being here and talking to us and telling us what they think and for us to respond to their needs. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. President, you have the final word. What is your promise to young people? Well, before I come to that, let me say, uh, we all feel very optimistic. And the grounds on which we base the optimism is that all of us, as we are here on the panel and in the audience, we seem to very well understand what we need to do. We must do it. And so that some of the things we are saying don't remain just as slogans and things like that we need to. Mm. And second, the young people are talking about and have talked about so many times in all sorts of ways, and we know there are millions and millions of them out there. We also need to be thinking of what we do more with them than for them. Because, because they, they really know what to do as well. All they need are these inputs which many people mentioned here. Uh, it's about access to different things they don't have access to. And at the same time, we also need to get them involved. There are certain decisions that have to be made at different levels, and the more they get involved in these decision-making processes, uh, the better. I think we get the best outcomes. 
And then uh, I, I think once they have a voice, once they make a contribution to what happens to them, to what happens to all of us, and uh, we should also be integrating. It's not just about the young people. It's about all of us. So we, we, we have to make sure that we look at the society as, as a complete mm -hmm. thing and then allow the different players to do their part. I think that's what I would say. Thank you very, very, very much. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, two days ago at the youth, uh, the Commonwealth Youth Forum, a young lady stood up and said, you know, we don't want to talk anymore about, you know, uh, with us, for us. We want to talk about with us all the time. We want to be in the rooms, not just about when it's about young people. We want to be in the rooms when it's about every issue. And, uh, and, and that kind of transformation in our approach to young people makes them a huge asset for our future, the common future that we're looking to head to. So please, ladies and gentlemen, a huge warm round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very, very much. And you may take your seats. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. As a panel, take their seats. I think you can give them a bigger round of applause for a good discussion. Um, we will play the video, but before we go to that, allow me to call our next speaker to come up and deliver the keynote address. Let's give a warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Dr. James Mwangi, Managing Director and CEO of Equity Group Holdings. Thank you. Your Excellency, uh, President uh, Kagame, Excellencies, uh, present invited guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great honor for the private sector to be allowed, uh, given a chance to add its voice. But let me tr uh, go straight, because of constraint of time, on the subject of global reset. That is what really is exciting that we are talking about global reset. It means that uh, we are living a 1945 movement, 77 years, 75 years, whichever figure you want to do, is when the current global economic and social order was set. That's when most of the institutions were set. COVID, for whatever it was, exposed the current economic and social order and its unsustainability. It demonstrated to the world how unsustainable the world had built. Business had lost trust with host communities. Inequalities had reached a level unprecedented in history. And Globalization, competitiveness, economies of scale, the theories upon which the world was being built have been really put to question because at the end of the day, it was availability. PPEs were not available when they were needed. Vaccines were not available in Africa when they were needed. As a result, the world has come to that moment again, a moment of global reset. I was not there. I bet you were not on, a, on that table. And maybe that is why our interest as the Commonwealth, because we were not on the table, as African nations, because we were not on the table, our interests were not taken into account. And as a result, we are where we are today. So the issue has been very well tackled by the panel uh, that spoke uh, before me. That this movement of reset is a movement 
of a new vision. It's a movement of a new leadership. It's a movement, like Judy have said, even the youth want to sit on the table. That is the movement we are living in. Fortunately, we are the generation that is in positions of influence and positions of leadership. And the question is, how will we reset the world? And I like clearly the theme of the conference or the forum, delivering a common future. And as President Kagame has uh, uh, put it uh, forward, it must be a, a common future of shared prosperity. It must be a future of uh, equal opportunities. And equal opportunities then promote uh, equal equality in society. As Adeshina said, it's a future of inclusivity where nobody is left uh, out. And so as we really look at this movement of resetting the world, a movement of a new vision, a movement of new leadership, the question is what role would the Commonwealth play? And the architects of the forum uh, came out strongly that by connecting, innovating and transforming, then we can create that common future of shared prosperity where the private sector, business, regains its trust with the host community, where inequality is addressed. It's on this basis that we as a private sector felt uh, we could add the voice that sustainability should have a multidimensional approach. But on a multidimensional approach, top of it would be a social inclusivity and sustainability and an environmental sustainability. The world need to recognize we as the leaders are holding the world in trust for future generations and we should leave it better than we, we uh, found it. It's on this basis that uh, the private sector with a lot of consultation, uh, we have come out with a proposal as to how the Commonwealth could come together. I want to acknowledge from the onset uh, because Equity decided if nobody is coming forward with a plain sheet, we'll come with a plain sheet and coordinate. We appreciate uh, Mokta Diop, he flew to Nairobi, and the next thing was that he gave me 22 of his top brains to be part of this uh, uh, co-creation. We have 16 development banks, Adeshina leading them, the African Development Bank, or the European Development Bank saying, yeah, it involves financing, we want to have our eyes on the plan and put so, so that we can support it, we can co-finance, and we can syndicate the African uh, banks as we finance this plan. I want to recognize the host governments, the national governments, they had their priorities right. The governments need to create the neighboring environment. So the priorities might be, must be right. Let me hasten to add like uh, Rwanda with the MICE strategy. The, it's clear what uh, Rwanda wants out uh, of the transformation. Becoming a global financial uh, and business uh, center. Focusing on the hospitality, which they have a focusing on logistics. So have everybody knows what they want, but it looks like we had no common plan that we could all put our hearts on. And with all the hearts on the deck, pulling or pushing the same direction, we believe the reset will happen and happen with our interest uh, considered. Let me also recognize the UN. The UN said this reset needs to take into account the uh, sustainable development uh, goals and they signed to the plan. And so essentially, it's a plan that the Commonwealth, then we felt we could sell to them. And after three visits to London to meet with the Commonwealth, 
I'm glad the Commonwealth said, hmm, looks like a coherent plan that we can adopt, and hand it over to President Kagame. And during his uh, two-year term of presidency, then the concept of execution can take ground and we lay a strong um, foundation. Armed with the concurrence of the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat, we went to the East African community and said, how does it look? And I saw Peter Ali alone, uh, Peter is here. Uh, Peter said, where do I sign on behalf of the East African community? We felt we were gaining ground, and then we, Secretary General of the African uh, Continental Free Trade Area, he said, this is a good plan. Let me now summarize the plan in just a few words. The first one, as we realized, when COVID hit, we stopped everything, but didn't stop eating. Adesina, you said Italia. The first priority is then to focus on agricultural productivity. And let's not uh, stop talking about African potential, Africa having 60% of all the Arab blood. Let's convert that Arab blood into productive agricultural land and uh, hopefully stem the food inflation that uh, has confronted the world. The second one is Africa is endowed significantly with mineral resource and mineral wealth. The mo that moment of reset has come for Africa to rethink, not to export oxides, but to add value to its mineral wealth and export finished goods. That will create million of millions of jobs for the young people. And there will be four more jobs in the formal sector. And our export values will go significantly. And of course, government revenue in taxes will be 30, 40 fold because of the enhanced value. And then is the great opportunity for the Commonwealth, for Africa to transform agriculture and the natural resource wealth. It requires massive investment, capital flows, between the Commonwealth countries in form of investment is the greatest opportunity. Out of that is also trade opportunities between ourselves. You, uh, you bring capital goods to Africa, Africa process, and then buy the processed uh, finished products. If Commonwealth, we were told, may not have legal frameworks for trade, but if we have a common objective and common values, that will be enough to be the basis of our investment and trade. Number three is what everybody has talked about, young people and women. Let's really capacitate our micro, small, and medium enterprises to populate the value chains of agriculture, uh, uh, mining, manufacturing, processing, trade, and investment. We'll have linked the young people to the formal sector, will have sustained them, will have made their jobs high value adding jobs. If truly we want the young people to be on the table, let's embrace knowledge, let's embrace uh, technology, let's embrace innovation, let's embrace science. Let's not do the traditional manufacturing and traditional industrialization. We are in that era where young people could lead, play a role if we use the tools that they are familiar with. And lastly, as we roll out this plan, let's pay attention to our environment, sustainability of our environment. Let's invest in social impact so that nobody is left behind. Let's capacitate uh, the young people, the women, the rural communities, so that they play a role in the economic activities and they get the benefits of the economic transformation. Let's protect our environment. Let's use clean energy. Let's adopt sustainable uh, processes. Lastly, on behalf of those championing 
a new course of Africa of the Commonwealth after the reset. I extend an invitation to you to have your hearts on the deck for then you'll be shaping the new global economic and social order and creating the order you would like to see. You no longer be passive, but you be active in shaping the future we all want, a common future of a common prosperity and a common wealth. That means the same thing to all of us. Thank you very much, and the invitation is extended to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James Mwangi. Thank you very, very much for that. Thank you for ending with the sustainability of the environment and investing in social impact. And, and the truth is our young people are way ahead of us in this regard. They are more passionate, they are more idealistic, they have the energy, and they can truly drive that agenda. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, our final thing now is the video. And so, technical team, I'm coming to you now. Um, over to you, let's take a look at the video. We are the Commonwealth, thank you. Eight hundred seventy three days ago, the novel coronavirus outbreak was declared a public health emergency of international concern. The world was not prepared for what was to come. Our lives and livelihoods came to a standstill. Global health inequity was exacerbated. Prevention measures such as restriction of movements negatively affected the way we interacted and did business with each other. Innovation accelerated as the best minds refocused their energies to stopping the pandemic and adapting to a changed world. And now, here we are in Kigali for the first and largest gathering of governments and businesses in the Commonwealth since the pandemic started. This is our opportunity to rethink and redesign policies, programs, and partnerships that will build back a stronger, sustainable and resilient world. We urge you to connect, discuss, debate and create tangible strategies that will answer the challenges we now face as we come out of the pandemic. How will we connect the Commonwealth through free trade barriers, easier movement of people and aligned social policies? How will we innovate to ensure the fourth industrial revolution benefits all in the fight against poverty and inequality? How will we transform our businesses to transition towards sustainable models that will protect our people and planet? There are 2.6 billion of us in the Commonwealth. We have the will and know-how to come together, seek lasting solutions and remain united. We are passionate about protecting our planet. We are committed to eliminating inequality. We are focused on transforming our world to one that is peaceful and just. This Commonwealth Business Forum is your moment to connect, innovate, and transform. Welcome to the Commonwealth Business Forum. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Connect, innovate, and transform. And let's finish with the words we heard earlier this morning. As we do all this, let's focus on putting the common back into the wealth. Thank you very, very much. A warm welcome once again. May I ask His Excellency, the President, and the dignitaries, um, would you please now get ready to visit the exhibition and see what Rwanda has put on offer on display for us all to see. Let's give them a round of applause as they stand up. And a round of applause for all of you. Thank you very, very, very much. And allow me now to hand over to the incredible Georgie. Can I ask you to come right back up? Thank you. Asante.
Thank you very much, Julie, and thanks to all of you for your kind attention. So we kindly request you not to leave the venue. Please do not leave the venue. We'll just alert you or let you know how, uh, at what point we can leave, but we should give it about 15, uh, 20 minutes uh, as they tour the exhibition. At this particular point, we'll take a quick look. Please, if you could just take your seats kindly. We know you've been sitting for long and you want to stretch, but we'll have a few minutes break before the next session. So to the 100 people that are supposed to uh, go to the groundbreaking of the Kigali Financial Square, you can see some of them leaving. Um, the entrance is at the Serena entrance, so the buses will be there to take you to the venue. So enjoy. The next session will be a plenary on leveraging the Commonwealth for um, global recovery. We'll go through that session with Alanria Akinola, who's the head of content at the Norwegian African Business Association for Germany. But in the meantime, a lot of you, as we'd mentioned before, are very keen on what exactly you can do in Rwanda. So the technical team, please, let's watch that video as people wait uh, to be cleared to go to the other side. Please enjoy. We'll meet at a different time. So after this video and after a few minutes, We'll have a break for about five to ten minutes, then please join us back in the room. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Kigali. Now I know you've traveled far and wide to come to the land of a thousand hills. And whether this is your first time to visit Rwanda or you're a frequent flyer, we cannot wait to show you the amazing, exciting things our capital city has to offer throughout the entire Chogam week. Now let's start right here. In the heart of the city, from the 20th of June all the way through to the 25th of June, you can check out the Kigali Street Festival right here at the Imbuga City Walk, where you can discover our amazing Made in Rwanda artisans, some street food, and so much more. And even at night, Kigali is buzzing. We just love to have a great time. And you can see it for yourself at the Kigali People's Festival, here in the Car Free Zone of Kisimenti and the Nyamirambo Car Free Zone. And we've got some amazing food. For the active souls, we've got you covered. Sign up for the Kigali Nights Run on the 21st of June at 7 p.m. It'll be fun, come on. And you know what they say, our common health is our common wealth. It's only 5K, you can do it, come on. Are you a fashion enthusiast? Then get your ticket to a front row seat at the launch of the Commonwealth Marketplace at Atelier on the 21st of June. Also come get your hands on some of the most exciting fashion must-haves by curated designers from all across the Commonwealth. So whether you're a bowler or a batsman or just a fan of great sport, don't miss the cricket exhibition match which will take place here at the magnificent Gahanga Cricket Stadium on the 23rd of June. I'm going to have a go. And on the 24th of June, tee off at the networking golf tournament here at the Kigali Golf Resort. Put your golfing skills to the test. To top off a very special week, Catch a vibe at the Chop Life Kigali concert on the 25th of June in BK Arena. The lineup is incredible. You will not want to miss it. Get your tickets. But for now, enjoy everything that Kigali has to offer and the very, very best wishes for a successful chugger. Once again, you're most welcome, Murakazanez. <laughs> 